And it's interesting, if we as an employer in this country provide, for example, in buildings, the sprinkler systems and the alarm systems, should we be providing anything different elsewhere, abroad? And, and, and that's an, an interesting moral issue. If we're sending our staff out to South America or Asia, should we be letting them go into office environments or into environments which have got lower standards of risk management than we do here? And again, it's something else that needs to be, needs to be looked at. I know Barry talked about having emergency plans and management systems. It's interesting that we are looking at um, a lot of organizations who are now putting in global management systems. And they want to have the same standards throughout the world. Um, and they believe that they've got that moral duty to, to, to put those standards in place but also that if they're sending staff out from here, those management systems need to be in place. And if we're looking at the duty of care or even the corporate manslaughter within this country, which is based on systemic failures, those management systems are even more important. And we've got to make sure those systems that are in place are workable. And, and as rightly so, once you need the um, emergency plan in place, which needs to be flexible, for evidencing the fact that you are addressing those issues, you still need to have it in place and you still need to have evidence that actually you're following and running those management processes and emergency plans. And on the emergency plans and on the, 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 um, uh, the input of good emergency plans, again as Barry was said, one of the most important things which companies fail to do is, is test those plans, run those emergency processes. And again, for natural disasters, that, fair, that is very, very hard, because how do you do it? Um, one of the things that came out of the World Trade Center, and whilst that wasn't a natural disaster, it was interesting, one of the things that came out of that in the investigation, um, Ulster University and Liverpool University interviewed a lot of the survivors. Um, and what came out of that was, I think there's something like 290 survivors that were interviewed. Now, over 90% of them said that before they left the building, they were given the warnings, they stopped to shut off their computers, to save their work, to change their shoes, to go to the toilet. Over 90% of them did that before they left the building. And of those 90%, it was suggested, or we thought, that they spent on average up to eight minutes doing those sort of things. In fact, some of them had spent up to 30 minutes finishing work before they left the building. And two companies, one which were Morgan Stanley, put, agree that, that the reason their people got out, the majority of people got out, is because their emergency plans that they had in place worked and that running up to that whole process, they enforced training of those emergency plans and made people get out. Um, and so it's important when we look at, at the systems that we've got in place, that we put in plans which are trialled, and that is a failure that we see so regularly. It is unbelievable. And again, we think in this country we're pretty good, but yet we still, we still have senior people in particular who when there's an emergency plan they will still sit in their office and, and, and from a behavioural point of view that is suggesting to people it's not that important, you don't need to do it. And following most accident investigations when you talk, and we've involved in a number of fatal investigations, when you talk to staff, quite often they will say, well we didn't think it was that important because, you know, our manager didn't make us do it, or they didn't do it, so how important was it? We thought but actually it was more important to get the job done. You know, and you look at somewhere like New York and what happened there, and you think, is it worth it? And interesting, one of the, some of the other things that came out of that, and we look at emerging plans, some of the little details that you forget about really, is that some of the other people that successfully escaped were those who ended up with a fire ward with a torch, and they were able to see better which way they went. And, and, it's, and, and, and it's how far you take your emerging plans. And what, what do you include in those? 
But certainly the management systems, we're looking at corporate manslaughter and looking at um, duty of care uh, and the liability, those systems are vitally important that they're in place, people know them, and, and, and they've been trialled. But you've got to at least have a place and, you know, are, do you know where your staff are, which again has been discussed. Do you know where they should be, where they are, the communication, because it may not affect those people, but you've got to at least have a communication process in place, and that's part of the plan, that they will inform a hub and manager the fact that they are okay, they're not in the centre of Christchurch, they are somewhere else, so we do not now have to worry about that person and their family, or at least we can contact their family. So it's those basic elements of a plan that need to be put in place. And as I say, you've got to have, and which is the most difficult thing, senior management support. I think the challenge that, that, that directors or boards have is to make sure there are equal standards throughout the world. And that's very, very difficult, as we'll, we're finding in some of the, some of the um, places that, that we're going for just general health and safety elements. I mean, uh, like South America, where there's a completely different view on this sort of thing. Uh, and then the funny thing is, again, it's, it's, it's looking at being proactive and sometimes it's the small things that, that also help. Again, looking at the, the New York incident, um, what happened in that was a lot of the fire exits were blocked and there was things in place. And it is looking at, is there, are there processes in place to make sure fire exits, people can get out, you know, and the walkways are cleared. They're very mundane, you know, God, here we go again, a safety officer coming in and telling us to do this. But when something happens, those are the things which are vitally, vitally important, including in the natural disaster, because people panic and they want to go. Uh, and, if, and, if, and if they've never been through this whole process, it becomes a lot harder. And actually, one of the other things that the good plans or plans in place help is the psychology of it and, 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 and pe people's mental well-being. If something happens and they're reasonably well-trained, as in Morgan Stanley, then, then actually... <coughs> From a mental point of view, from a psychology point of view, it's much better for them because they know what to do, and hopefully they automatically kick in. It's, again, it's interesting when you look at um, accidents within airlines are a good example, I think. And, and all, most airlines will have um, same aircraft, more or less, and should be same training standards. You know, they're, they're most of the aircrew are trained to the same standard. And yet, when you look at studies of accidents and incidents in airlines, they talk something like a 42% difference um, in incidents between the airlines. And a lot of that has got to be down to behaviour. You know, I know I was on a, fl a flight once um, abroad, and, and uh, I won't say where, and as we came into the land, people were standing up and they were taking bags off, and, and nobody did anything. And that, no, that was okay. Whereas if you do it in, I guess, British Airways or Virgin or any of these big airliners, not only will the crew shout at you, they'll come and physically throw you in your seat and they will not accept people not following the standards. And again, that's something behaviourally and cushioning we've got to push through. Uh, and with natural disasters, it's very, very difficult, isn't it? Um, so there's two elements of risk assessment. I know just briefly I'm, I'm watching the time. Is, um, there's two elements of risk assessment, and it's the risk assessment on the facility and what can the impact <coughs> of the facility and the impact of the facility on others. And there's two distinct things that need to be looked at, and the emergency plans need to be put in place, in place for that. And again, Japan is a, is a good example of, of the impact that that can have, and that is still happening. Um, from the point of view of um, the natural disaster plan itself, and, and the problem with the risk assessment, as I say, is, is, is the perception of senior management involvement. Um, and I think it's, 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 it should become slightly easier to argue that with climatic change and, and with what is happening with a number of natural disasters, particularly if you are working in countries, China, India, those sort of things, that there is the potential for this to occur. And actually one of the good things is that some of the countries like China now are doing risk mapping of the areas, or area risk mapping, which are putting out potential risk areas for earthquakes, for floods. Um, and, I, and I think that, could, that, that, that will help in, in this planning and raising the assessment side of things. Because 
And, it's, and then again, it's a desirable thing. Most deaths in national disasters occur, uh, occur because of that initial traumatic impact. And it is looking at how we deal with survivors. And it is going to be the communication, the first aid at that initial point, um, and how we deal with that. Uh, and, and the mental and psychology of it. Again, if, if people know that there is a first aid equipment, good, and these are the things that I need to do to deal with this, those are the sort of issues that, that we need to be looking at, and that comes from the risk assessment, initial risk assessment of, of what are the issues that are going to arise. Um, I mean, it's looking at uh, adequate understanding of the potential risks. Um, and the impact, you're, you're right, the street crime which increases following that. Uh, and again, people are desperate in those situations as well. That might be lack of food and wanting food. The evacuation process, do you evacuate, in our case, British nationals? And again, there's some issues with that. Where do you evacuate them? Because evacuating British nationals, what does that do to the morale of the people who are left behind? What does that say to them? Um, and someone has got to make those decisions. Do you evacuate them out of the country? Do you evacuate every, everybody out of that disaster zone and somewhere else? Where do you put them up? Because there's going to be a shortage of, of beds and hotels and information and transport and how do you deal with that? Yeah, and, and no one says these are easy. They're very, very difficult. The roles and responsibilities is hugely important. In any element of health and safety, the roles and responsibilities is clarity. There's so much, from a health and safety point of view, so many Incidents are down to lack of clarity in who is responsible for what. <coughs> Even down to the fact who is responsible for making sure those first aid kits go to who need them. And, you know, are they adequate for the job or do we just go down to B&Q and get the first first aid kit and give everybody that first aid kit? You know, and that happens. It does happen. Um, looking at this is interesting, but it's having documented protocols for communication and deciding where the centre, the communication hub should be. Is it going to be in the facility itself, outside the facility? So that all communication is coming through that. And again, there's a problem because in certain uh, disasters in the past, um, the web has gone down, simply because there's so many people getting on it, or, or, or because of other issues. So, so again, that was a, that's a problem. I, had a, 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 I read this document from the, the States, which I thought was very good, in that it went through all the different elements of communication that you put in place, web and phone, down to the fact that two cans, and I actually said two cans with a bit of string in between them, you can send somebody off swimming and, and over dikes and so you can talk to each other. If not, it probably won't work, but at least it might get rid of the crazy guy who's sending everybody nuts. And, and, and that wasn't one of the plans that there was in, in, this, in this particular area. But evacuation plans, it is looking at who makes those decisions, who organises, who is the person who deals with that side of things. Uh, and you're looking at communication systems as we talk about the cars. Um, one of the other things is returning to the office afterwards. You know, who gives the authority for people to go into place which potentially is at risk? And should they do that? Um, and, and what will happen is safety rules that ordinarily are in place, do they go to, by the wayside? And who makes those decisions? You know, the companies what permits work for doing this, for dealing with electric. I follow a natural disaster, that goes out the window, and people are going into buildings which are very, very dangerous. Uh, and again, that's something else that, that needs, to be, needs to be addressed. We talked about the families. Um, the counselling potential that is given afterwards to families um, and family support, people with special needs. So there's lots and lots of things to consider. <coughs> but I think one of the most interesting things for me is this, the human psychology of it uh, and this, this element. Uh, and I don't think this is just for natural disaster. I think this is for practically every emergency situation. It ain't going to happen to us. Um, 96% of the financial executives survey, this is the uh, uh, FM Global's Natural Disaster Business Risk Survey, 96% of the financial executives surveyed say their companies have operations that are exposed to natural catastrophes like hurricanes, floods, earthquakes. Yet fewer than 20% said their organizations were very concerned, which I guess that's not that surprising, but it is kind of scary. And it comes back to this, it won't happen to me. Um, looking at Hurricane Katrina, um, 
I think the next year, the following year, there was Hurricane Ike in the same area, and the people were given urgent warnings to leave. And despite the fact they'd been through Hurricane Katrina, loads of them didn't, and over 100 people were killed. And following that, they surveyed 1,100 people who lived in that area a year later, and only 17% of them had done some work on their home to try to protect it a little bit better. You transfer that into the business world, and it becomes a little bit scary, doesn't it? The fact that people don't think it's going to happen to them. Um, and that behavioral side of things is one of the most important issues in all of this. It's getting people to prepare for this disaster, whether it be a political or whether it be a natural. Senior manager have got to prepare. And I've got to put in place at least as much help and assistance and guidance as possible. Um, and train staff. Uh, you know, good plans which are well rehearsed do contribute to the safety of people, both physically and, as I say, psychologically. And I like this, and Philip quotes here today, but I like these. What separates the people who do prepare for disasters from those who don't is mental acceptance to the fact that crisis could indeed occur. Such people tend to have a high degree of ethical behavior, integrity, and most importantly, the courage to face reality and deal with it. And I guess from a behavior point of view, people and businesses are down to followers and leaders, aren't they? And the question to ask senior management, are they leaders or are they followers? Are they going to put in something which actually industry can hold up and say, yeah, that's a good idea, let's follow that. Um, and, and motivation in many organizations is down to a few, it's down to a few isn't it? Um, there's a lot of uh, industrial in, in, inertia, I suppose, when it comes to these sort of things. Um, and that's why it's quite nice to see so many people here today. Um, I guess sometimes it's, it's, it's the people who come to these things are the people who are going to do something about it. And, and it's the other side of the industry that we've got to look at. Um, but the main elements within any natural disaster, say, is, is persuading the man management to put in place the risk assessments and the programs and emergency plans. And the human impact is huge. And, and here's, a, here's another quote from someone who was a hurricane survivor in America. And they talked about the hurricane was not, not the scary, but it wasn't a hurricane. No, that, that wasn't was scary. But the worst thing was after, during the entire week that followed that event, we were not able to go out of the house. All the roads were cut off. We did not have any running water or phones. Under those conditions, the hardest part was having no contact with the rest of my family. The feeling of presuming the death of your close friends and relatives was hard to endure. We stayed like that for one week where everything was fixed. For me, those seven days almost did were a real nightmare. And it is looking at, as we talked before, the counseling and the after effect, the staff that are involved in these incidents, which people see, and possibly deaths. Or be living that, and the impact on a family of not knowing because the company don't have basic communication systems in place. And, and, and I know it sounds easy, but, but that is. So I guess what, what you got to ask yourselves is, from a company's point of view, is do, do your does your organisation assess risk in the, its proper context and look at the potential of these disasters happening? Mm -hmm. Um, do they operate on a philosophy that is largely based on the fact that insurance will cover us? Or do they have a wider view of risk management, whereas there is more of an impact, a human impact, as well as a physical and psych impact? Uh, and does the organisation look at prevention rather than wait for something to happen? And lastly, do you have systems in place? And, and again, I'm not a great one for systems, but are just these huge systems that have got to be workable, they've got to be simple enough for people to understand. But they've got to be in place. Otherwise, organizations are opening themselves in a big way to following any prosecutions or litigation problems.